Today we're looking at Mark chapter 6, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Um, Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. This is one of those miracles that's recorded in all four Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. John is different. Um, but two miracles appear in all four Gospels. It's the resurrection and when Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is one of those miracles that all four Gospel writers record for us. It's super important because it shows us that Jesus is the gracious and compassionate King. It's something that only God could do. Only God could take a couple of fish and a couple of crackers or loaves or whatever you, you may think it was and feed an enormous crowd. Only God can do that. It's a true story. It actually happened. Jesus feeds the 5,000. And what I want us to see from this story this morning is I want us to see Jesus as the gracious and compassionate king. So if you have a Bible open to Matthew, or Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44, Mark chapter 6, if you're on a device, uh, I'd encourage you to go to the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Um, if you want a scripture journal, we have some. If you want a Bible, a hard print Bible, we have some on the back table as well. But do what you can to be in the same translation that we're in this morning. I read and teach from the CSB. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. It says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. So they went away in the boat by themselves to a remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognized them, and they ran out on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. When he went to shore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted, and it's already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You give them something to eat, he responded. They said to him, Should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he instructed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up twelve baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. Incredible miracle that all four gospel writers felt was so important for us to see that the Holy Spirit led all four of them to write to us. Incredible miracle. True story. True story. Like, this actually happened. It wasn't like Jesus teaching us that we all should just be sharers. It's funny, you see kids in youth sports, it's hilarious to me. Like, when they first enter into youth sports, for like 166 hours a week, they're told to share, and then for the two-hour sports practice and game, they're told to be selfish and go get the ball. Like, it's, it's hilarious to me. It's not like this is a lesson on sharing. We have to see this as something that only God could do. We have to see the compassion and greatness and the graciousness of King Jesus here in this text. Because this isn't a lesson on sharing. This is a lesson on Jesus as God. The gracious and compassionate King. Jesus as God. True story. Actually happened. I mean, he took, he took basically a kid's lunch sack. And fed, some people say, almost 20,000 people. 5,000 men plus women and children would have eaten. So he took... A kid's lunch sack that had two small fish and five loaves. Now Dylan gets a turkey and cheese sandwich, a bag of chips, and a Capri Sun every day. Now imagine if he tried just to feed his class of 20 kids with that. Right? 
not going that far, right? Because Dylan wants his chips. He might give you the turkey cheese sandwich. He's not going to give you the Capri Sun, and he's probably not going to give you the chips because he's 11. But imagine moms and dads, kids, when you're packing your lunch tomorrow for school, those that aren't going to school, when you sit down to lunch this afternoon, imagine taking your lunch and Jesus using your lunch to feed almost 20,000 people. Something that only God could do. See, this isn't a lesson about sharing. This is a lesson about the greatness, the compassion, the graciousness of King Jesus. And we have to see him as this great, gracious, and compassionate king. This story opens up. It says the apostles returned from ministry. The twelve apostles returned from ministry. They had been sent out. If you read Mark chapter 6, you saw that Jesus sent them out in pairs. To do ministry. He gave them authority. He vested his authority in this group of people for a specific time and a specific purpose. And he sends them out to do ministry. And they come back. And they tell him all that they had done and taught. And interestingly to me, Jesus doesn't say, okay, go out, get, it, get even more. He says, take a rest. Because they didn't even have time to eat. They had returned from their ministry assignment where they had anointed the sick with oil, where they had healed people. They showed Jesus had given them authority over demons. They were preaching this message of repentance. And they get back and Jesus says, go rest for a while. Come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. And here's, here's what I'm learning the hard way. I haven't learned this completely, but I'm learning the hard way is that Rest is a requirement because there's always work to be done. We don't rest when we're finished with the work. We rest because we know there's more work. That's just a side note. We rest because there's more work. And Jesus is offering them this gracious gift of rest. If you remember when we saw Jesus' authority over the Sabbath, he said, the Sabbath is a gift to you. Like Because of the fall, our work became burdensome and hard. But work was part of God's good design for people before sin ever entered the equation, work was part of the equation for us. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, that it, sin entered the world, work became burdensome for us. But God, in his grace, gives us a rest from our work. He says, you can accomplish more my way than you can ever do on your own. I used to joke with people that I would rest in retirement. And I'm reali I've realized the hard way how foolish that is. That we need to find healthy rhythms of work and rest. We have to have healthy rhythms of work and rest. The, the rest that Jesus is calling them to is a gracious offer to them. They had more work to do, and because their work would not be finished, he calls them to rest. I was reading another pastor that experienced a season of burnout that was just unimaginable, his testimony from it. And he said, hard work requires hard rest. Hard work requires hard rest. So the, the apostles come back from the ministry. Jesus calls them to rest, and they go away in a boat, and the people can see them, and they start running after them, trying to figure out where they're going next. They start running ahead of them because they're interested in the Jesus Miracle Tour. They're interested in the Jesus Miracle Tour. So they follow them. Imagine, like, the biggest pop star on the planet. I don't even know who that would be today. Word breaks on Twitter where the tour bus is headed. And the interstate shuts down because they know that the tour bus is headed there. Like, I don't even know who it would be. I can tell you sports stars, but I can't tell you pop stars. Sorry. They land on shore, and Jesus sees this huge crowd. It says in verse 34, when he went to shore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them. Jesus saw the crowd and had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. This word compassion, one of the writers I was reading this week, writing specifically about the word used here for compassion, that word is only assigned to Jesus or someone in a parable and, and intended to represent Jesus. It's this gut level concern. See, first century, like we would say, oh, it broke my heart, right? That's what we would say. Like we equate the heart with the, the seat of our emotions first century they would have equated like the gut the bowels like you know when you get so excited you lose your appetite 
Like, it, they, they view the seat of the emotions in the gut, not in the heart. So that's why this compassion would be like a gut-level concern that I can't not act. I have to act. Jesus saw them, and he had compassion on them. And he wasn't compassionate. He didn't have this compassion because of of their physical need, although he did meet physical needs. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The religious leaders of the day were so horrible, so awful, all they were concerned with was controlling and manipulating people. His compassion drove them because they needed to be led to worship God. They needed to be led in the things of God. Like sheep without a shepherd. He, was, he had compassion over their spiritual state. And I don't think this is a specific indictment on the people. It's more like an indictment on the religious leaders of the day because they were awful. They had missed the point of the entire Old Testament system. They were called to lovingly lead people to worship God. Instead, they used the rule book, created their own rule book, and used that to manipulate and control people. The prophets in the Old Testament called out the shepherds of Israel Jesus in the Gospels has some of the strongest words toward the religious people, the religious leaders of the day. And seeing these people led so, for, so poorly evoked compassion, a gut-level concern. And so interestingly, he doesn't say he had compassion and he immediately started healing. He, didn't, he didn't, that doesn't say he had compassion on them and immediately started doing this or started doing this. It says immediately started teaching them. He started pointing them to the truth of the gospel. It says in verse 34, when he went to shore, he saw the large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. He began to teach them. Their single greatest need was not dinner. Their single greatest need was not healing. Their single greatest need was not comfort or security. Their single greatest need was the gospel. Jesus starts teaching them, calling them to repent and believe. They were like sheep without a shepherd. What we see in the rest of the New Testament is God's design for his people is for Jesus, the chief, chief shepherd. Jesus as the shepherd of the church. And then God called and qualified men leading the church as he calls and qualifies men. That's kind of what we call under shepherds. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. He starts teaching them. Well, Jesus is teaching, and you know, it starts to get late. So the disciples, they encourage Jesus to send them away. Like The, the disciples are thinking, okay, how are we going to fix this? It's coming up on dinner time. Uh, we got tons of people here, maybe as many as 20,000 people, including children and women and, and men. Uh, maybe we got 20,000 people. What are we going to do? Um, we got to do something. Let's just send them away. Just send them away. But Jesus had other plans. And John's account of this Miracle says that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, but he asked them questions to test their faith. He says, you guys figure it out. Get them something to eat. Well, they start running the numbers. So appreciate that they start running the numbers, because I'm a numbers guy. So appreciate that they start running the numbers. They start running the numbers, and they say, oh, it's going to take 200 denarii just to give them a little bit, a little, little taste of something. That would be like uh, 200 days worth of pay. Uh, a denarius, a singular denarius, is a day's pay for a day laborer. So he's basically saying, take, I don't know, a nine months pay to feed this many people, even just a little taste, according to John's account. And here, here's what I think we need to, to see, is that the apostles did everything they knew to do. They knew there was a problem, and they did everything that they knew to do. They weren't just like sitting back and saying, ah, what if? They knew there was a problem, and they did everything that they knew to do. But then they looked to Jesus to do what only Jesus can do. They couldn't do anything but send him away, but Jesus has other plans. He gives this incredible miracle. He takes the fish and the loaves and blesses God this is a fatherly type of blessing at a Jewish meal where the father would look up his eyes to heaven and bless God for what was there. So Jesus gives this fatherly type of blessing. 
and then he just starts feeding people. They sit down in fifties and hundreds in the green grass, and the food doesn't run out. Absolutely incredible miracle. Something that only God can do. Something that only God can do. Jesus feeds this enormous crowd. Not only Jesus, does Jesus have the ability to feed this crowd from basically a kid's lunchbox worth of food, he has a desire to feed the crowd. I think we need to see that as we see Jesus as the compassionate and gracious king. He wanted to feed them. It wasn't just that he could, he wanted to. He had a desire to feed them. He knew exactly what he was going to do, and he chose to feed them. We see Jesus as the gracious and compassionate king of the world. He's in control over all things, and he desires your good. If you are a Christian, he desires your good, your eternal good. Not just your temporary good, but he desires your eternal good. And everything that happens in your life as a Christian, everything that happens in your life is making you more and more like Jesus. It is for your eternal good, even if we can't understand pain today. Pain is real. Suffering is real. Suffering in the life of a Christian is a guarantee. But every second of suffering is meant to make you more and more like Jesus for your eternal good. Jesus does what only God could do, and, and when he acts like this, he alone gets the glory. The apostles, fresh off the ministry trail, they're taking zero credit for this one. Zero credit. Like, there is no credit that they could offer for this one. This is Jesus' alone, his work alone, to be glorified as a result of this supernatural feeding. It says, in, in my English translation, verse 42 says that everyone ate and was satisfied. Everyone ate and was satisfied. Their physical need was completely met. Everyone ate and was satisfied. I wonder what the kid with the lunchbox thought. As he kind of grew up into adulthood, I think this is one of the stories that just stuck with him. You think maybe it was like a fish story where it started with, oh, you should have seen it. It was 5,000 men. Oh, you should have seen it. It was like 45,000 men. Like, I wonder, as he got older, if he ever exaggerated this story. Fortunately, we had the Gospels to preserve this story for us. True story. I wonder, can you imagine? And this is just speculation. It's not part of the Bible, and it's not really necessary. But can you imagine him as like a grandpa telling his grandkids, saying, hey, let me tell you how great Jesus is. Let me tell you what happened. Like there was all these people. They were interested in the Jesus Miracle Tour 01. All these people coming to hear him. And nobody had any food. Can you imagine what he, how he told that story to his grandkids? I mean, it's just speculation, right? But it's okay. We read the Bible with our minds. And, Let's just, let's just let, our, let our thoughts go there for a second. I, I have to think that this, whether or not this kid ever turned from his sin and trusted in Jesus, we don't know. But I have to think this story, this actual happening in his life left a permanent mark on him that he told people about it. Surprisingly, or Maybe not surprisingly by now, John tells us that most of the people deserted Jesus. They were only interested in the Jesus Miracle Tour. They were not interested in the take up your cross daily and follow me. They were not interested in the deny yourself, follow me. They were not interested in the bless people when they say all kind of evil things about you. They were not interested in the follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They were really only misinterested in the meal plan. The meal plan, the miracle plan, the Jesus miracle tour, whatever you want to call it. That's all they were really interested in, most of the crowds. And then you even see later in John's gospel where they're like, you guys going to leave too? Jesus said, saying this to the apostles. You guys going to leave us too? 
They were interested in the benefit of Jesus without the cost of following Jesus. We have this picture of this gracious and compassionate <coughs> king. We have this picture of this gracious and compassionate king, and we need to figure out what we're going to do with him. Are we interested in the meal plan, or are we interested in the Savior of the world? Are we interested in following Jesus, or are we just interested in the benefit that we may get? Maybe I'll get sick and he'll heal me. What are we to do with this gracious and compassionate king? And here's where I've landed. We must surrender completely to him. Surrender completely to him. Everything in our lives. Jesus wants all of it. Surrender completely to him. All of it. Like all of it. We trust that his design for us is good. That God's design is good. It's for his glory and for our good. And we trust his design in all areas of our life. We must surrender completely to it. Where if the scripture says it, we believe it. Because we know that the scriptures are true and good and trustworthy. Surrender completely to him. That's first and most important. Next, I would say trust in him alone. Trust in him alone. There's this temptation to especially as men, speak directly to the men for a moment, there's this temptation as men to like trust in our own abilities, <laughs> trust in our own ability to figure things out, to make things happen. We're just going to work harder. And if we're not careful, that mindset can come into our Christian life, our faith, that really it's a little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of everything that I'm doing. But see... It, the scriptures say that it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his pleasure. Both how we think, this is Philippians 2, both how we think and how we act. It is God who works in you both to will and do according to his good pleasure. See, even the things that we do, we must be trusting in him alone. Trust that the scriptures in the spirit are moving in us and leading us in a way that will match what he says. Trust in Him alone, not in our own version of goodness or our own efforts or anything else. Third, follow Him in loving obedience. We follow Him in loving obedience. When we were in the Gospel of John well over a year ago, John talked, talked about belief. And there were three words that he used when he talks about believe. It's to believe, love, and obey. It's the, the kind of the trifecta, how those things go together. To believe, to love, and obey Jesus. We trust him in loving obedience. We believe he is who he says he is, and we, we allow for all of our affections to be returned to him, and then we obey him. Then we obey him. We trust him in loving obedience. Obedience, even when we don't understand. Even when we don't understand. What are we to do with this gracious and compassionate king? We've got two more. Work hard and rest hard. Work hard and rest hard. I was uh, uh, reading about this, this guy who's written this book about uh, work rhythms Incredible book. His name's Cal Newport. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but a really good book. The book's called Deep Work. And he talks about knowledge workers and how knowledge workers can maximize the value of their work and this type of thing. And he, he writes in his book about Teddy Roosevelt. And I guess when Teddy Roosevelt was in college, like he was on, on all kind of clubs and all kind of activities and all kind of <coughs> exercise regimens and was a boxer and a workouter and all of this stuff. And like, You'd imagine that his studies were, were really lacking, but they weren't. <clears throat> because he did all of these different things, but when it was time to work, he only worked. 
And it was amazing, like, the amount of focus he was able to do. And he was able to accomplish more in, like, four hours of deep study than all of his classmates could accomplish in, like, 14 hours of superficial study. And the only point in me bringing this up, this is out of my notes, but he, he, he learned how to work hard and then rest hard. He learned how to work hard and then rest hard. And I think that's something that we need to do with a gracious and compassionate king because we will always have work to do. We will always have more work to do. And because of that, we have to rest. Work hard, rest hard. <coughs> Finally, what are we to do with this gracious and compassionate king? I think we need to realize that there are some things only God can do. There are some things only God can do. Only God could have fed this crowd. There are some things only God can do. And we need to acknowledge that. And we need to trust in that. The apostles, they were trying to figure it out. They were trying to do what they thought they were supposed to do. They got to the end, and they decided, we've got nothing else. We've got to trust that this is something only you can do. Know that there are some things that only God can do. Heavenly Father, God, you are good, and you are gracious, and we love you. Lord, I pray over everyone here today, those watching online, Father, that we would be a people that trusts in you completely, that we would trust in you, that we would follow you completely in every area of our life. In Jesus' name I pray.